Well, hello. <laughs> Thank you for coming on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> um, so. Always oh, risky. Could have worn that water. Um, so I'm going to be reading from my my talk today because I literally finished it last night. And I'll tell you a little bit about the process. But first, I'd like to start with a prayer to Prajna Paramita, to whom this talk is dedicated. Beyond words, beyond thought, beyond description, Prajna Paramita. Unborn, unceasing, the very essence of space. Yet it can be experienced as the wisdom of our own awareness. Homage to the mother of the Buddhas of past, present, and future. Rahula Bhadra. So um, the title of this talk is Your Mother Called. It's a little bit of a, a joke, but Freud was right, you know, that there is no other woman in your life except your mother, the great mother. Um, yet as important as she is, uh, very few of us actually really see her. And so um, if you read my marketing pitch, pitch therefore we kind of um, miss out on knowing something about ourselves. So... Um, this seemed fitting uh, kick, to kick off Losar with this talk. Um, with you know, during the Tibetan New Year's, we're, with all the offerings of food and prayers and gratitude, um, you know, it seemed fitting to celebrate the Great Mother. You know, for that we reflect. So before we dive in, uh, as is customary, I'll share some of the sources with you that I grazed upon, <laughs> um, and that I'll reference here and there, but um, Heart Sutra by Red Pine, Heart of the Buddha, Chogram Trungpa Rinpoche, Harmony of Views. This is a, a quite a, quite a beautiful piece. This kind of informed it. I don't really quote a lot from it because it's pretty dense, but it's just baked into this. And then Dakini's Warm Breath by Judith Simmer Brown, which is quite a work of scholarship. So back in the back they go. So as well, there were dozens, literally dozens of articles. Um, and I don't remember the name of all of them. Not that it matters, but uh, you can't really think your way through this as I soon discovered. Then, of course, the disclaimer, obviously, all errors and omissions are my own. <laughs> Despite being told otherwise, I will get it wrong. Um, but nevertheless, she persisted. Also, I asked for your patience because um, uh, as I worked through this, it was difficult. It was a big, meaty piece of steak. And, uh, and um, I... I struggled to organize this thing as I struggled to understand as well. And I'll share some of that with you in a moment. But um, I hope you brought your breadcrumbs so we can find our way out. So the last time I was here, um, I shared some things about that I had read about the Heart Sutra. And funny enough, I seem to have talked about literally everything except Prajnaparamita. <laughs> you know, the center and her mantra. But I literally ran out of time and, uh, and, and steam. And then um, later I realized that it was a little bit like building a church and forgetting the, the, the steeple or the stained glass or something. There was something essential. It's probably a bad metaphor, but there was something essential that had been left out. I was content to let it just be an oops and um, had hoped to not lose as much sleep and stamina this time around. So I, with that, I went into Darshan hoping for a topic like how to choose a nice Dharma bag. And I came out with this assignment on Prajna Paramita, was not expecting that, um, but you know, I count my blessings. I was let off the hook for the PowerPoint. So there was that. All right, 
so um so I went home with the assignment and got out my nails and hammer and books and my conceptual two by fours and started building a talk on Prajna Paramita. And it was full of who said what and when and how and what people thought and what that might have meant. And um, I was building my little house and built on how everybody told me that it should be. But without light or heat or heart, it was uninhabitable and hollow. And uh, the center couldn't hold. And then the construction collapsed. So uh, a few times I went to uh, Rinpoche and then he sort of jangled the shit out of it and <laughs> it fell apart. And so then it was like, well, what now? So, um, you know, besides crying and gnashing my teeth. So I just, I went home a couple of days ago to total silence, like crickets. What was I going to talk about? How would I approach this? But then the weird thing was, is I wasn't strung out anymore. I wasn't even nervous. I mean, it was just a free fall. So strangely, out of that strange, quiet space, I got a glimpse of the great mother's stocking. And so this is the talk. But first, let's revisit the Heart Sutra a little bit by way of context and just to anchor ourselves. The Heart Sutra is central to Mahayana Buddhism and is one of the sutras or sermons of the Buddha that's recited frequently in uh, monasteries everywhere and Dharma centers. And we do that here ourselves as we just did. And the Buddha's teachings are framed uh, over the course of his life in kind of three major transmissions represented as the turning of the wheel of Dharma. The first turning of the wheel or first transmission was given in Deer Park in Sarnath and came right after the Buddha's enlightenment and was on the Four Noble Truths and covered the truth and the types of suffering that we experience, the causes of suffering and cessation in the path out. The second turning was given at Vulture's Peak, stop me if you've heard this, during a very dark and difficult time in the Buddha's life and it deals with Prajnaparamita or the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, which covers the topic of emptiness and the stages for gaining discriminating discriminating awareness of it. And of course, you can see this is where the Heart Sutra fits in. So I thought that was interesting. I, I didn't really know that. There's a lot I don't know. As an FYI, the third transmission deals with the uh, Buddha nature or the innate factors that we all have that, uh, that will allow us to become enlightened ourselves, but that's definitely for somebody else's talk. But anyway, I thought it was interesting to know that it was part of the second wheel, the second turning, and it's strange to me because these truths are so radical that, I mean, there's enough to chew on for the rest of my life here. And then, of course, people died when they heard it, you know, they had heart attacks, they vomited blood. So I'm not sure how you sell tickets to the next turning. <laughs> Um, so who or what is Prajnaparamita? Well, Chokram Trungpa Rinpoche speaks to her through the symbolic language of poetry when he says, Prajnaparamita, inexpressible by speech or thought, unborn, unceasing with a nature like sky, only experienced by discriminating awareness wisdom, mother of the victorious ones of the three times we praise you and prostrate. In Sanskrit, the Heart Sutra is called the Bhagavati Prajnaparamita Hridaya Sutra, or the essence of the Blessed Mother, the heart of transcendent perfection of wisdom. It is wisdom realizing emptiness. It's also interesting because Bhagavati means blessed one, and it's the feminine form of Bhagavan or Buddha. So she's a Buddha. So straight away, we see that um, and honoring and acknowledging of the feminine principle here, which is why she's also called the great mother, the mother of all the Buddhas, the lady perfection of wisdom. She goes by many names. I wanna spend a moment, I am not a Sanskrit expert, but I think it's helpful. We, we say these, you know, every Sanskrit word seems to have 14 letters in it, minimum, and they all have meaning. 
you know, it's not like she was named, you know, I don't know, Lucy. So her name, uh, if we break it down, prajna means wisdom or discriminating awareness. And paramita means perfection. But breaking it down a little bit more, the pra means before and shna or na, however I've heard it pronounced different ways, is knowing. And together they point towards an understanding wisdom, a clarifying that wisdom is really this before knowing. Roshi Pat and Kyo O'Hara, um, the abbot of the village Sendo, says this before knowing is before we form an opinion. And it's distinct from intellectual knowing that happens after something has occurred, after an experience, after our sense consciousnesses encounter an object. And we form an idea or a judgment about it. So um, this intellectual way of knowing is dualistic, right? There's a subject and a perceiver, a perceiver and a perceived, a subject and an object. But before knowing is open and spacious. There's not knowing, and you sit with something. And when you have more of a, it's when you have more of a question than a thought, and you're waiting for that answer. And it could happen on the cushion, or it could happen when an artist maybe approaches a blank canvas with pure spontaneity, or when your essay has been dismantled for the third time, I'm just saying, and you have no idea what you know or don't know or what you want to say. This is an experience of emptiness or shunyata. And it's a moment that's fresh and alive and rife with possibilities. Roshi says that in before knowing, there's a fresh perspective. We see the wisdom of different perspectives and the other side of things before we get stuck in our own point of view. It does require that we trust ourselves this moment without crutches of what someone told us, what we overheard or saw on social media. Lama Jimpa Rinpoche says that this is direct knowing, not something that you can see with your eyes, not a logical inference or anything studied. And when it happens, it's immediate, direct, experiential, and wholly unequivocally true, like two plus two equals four, so clear, or I can't drink anymore. <laughs> this kind of done, no knowledge, insight, not thought out, not logical, not you know, justified, rationalized. All right, so that's para. The next paramita, or prajna, paramita is the perfection or transcendence, something that has gone beyond. I wanted to say also that prajna points to the qualities of prajna paramita, this quality of emptiness and spaciousness. It's uncontrived, non-conceptual awareness, and I'll pick this up in a little bit. So paramita, perfection, but of course, we can't just stop there. And parami also means the other shore. So here it means going beyond our own notion of the self, beyond our own conventional understanding of the self in the sense that our actions and attitudes are done in a non-egocentric manner. Transcending the self. The paramitas are uh, virtues or far-reaching re attitudes that work together to help us realize our full potentials as bodhisattvas or bodhisattvas in training. And uh, there are six of them, and we've talked about them here a lot, you know, and there are ways that uh, states of mind that help lead us to liberation and enlightenment, generosity, ethical self-discipline, patience, perseverance, mental stability or concentration, and then wisdom or discriminating wisdom. By blending them all together into our daily lives, they help us avoid problems and problem solve and reduce and el eliminate disturbing emotions and be of real benefit to others through skillful means. In, um, it's also interesting that of all of the perfections, Wisdom is the one that's called out and praised by the Buddha. In Mother of the Buddhas, which is a translation of the Prajnaparamita Sutras by Lex Hickson, there's a discussion between the Buddha and Ananda 
on the power of wisdom. Ananda observes that Buddha doesn't single out for praise any of the other paramitas, but only perfection of wisdom does he continually mention, praise, and radiantly transmit. The Buddha explains that this is because without wisdom, you can't transform the other five into their purest states of selflessness, of selfless giving, selfless goodness, selfless patience, selfless commitment, selfless meditation. Each paramita, the Buddha says, can only be sustained by the conscious presence of Prajna Paramita. The other perfections shine forth through the indivisibility and unthinkability of Prajna Paramita, whose blissful transparency is the fulfillment of all the highest ideals and aspirations of human life. So wisdom's the golden ticket. Prajna Paramita is the wisdom realizing emptiness. It's the goal of all bodhisattvas and the path out of suffering, because without wisdom, it doesn't matter how much bodhicitta we have or how many of the great qualities we're working on, we'll never be able to transcend samsara. In the Heart Sutra, Avalokiteshvara declares that everything we know about ourselves, our world, is empty. He smashes the idea of who we are, stripping away the five skandhas or collections that, that we're all made of our form, our physical body, right? Our feelings, the sensations we have in our body, the perceptions with our sense organs, our mental formations or thoughts, and our consciousness, our awareness of these things. They're all empty, but empty of what? Thich Nhat Hanh observed that empty is an interesting word because to be empty is to be empty of something. A cup can be empty of tea, but it doesn't mean the object doesn't exist. So empty is really empty of a separate self. And they're saying that none of the skandhas exist by itself alone. They have to coexist. They have to interbe. So they can be empty of a separate self, but full of the cosmos. That's Thich Nhat Hanh. The scholar Alexander Berzin puts it another way. He says, emptiness is a lack of intrinsic nature. Nothing has qualities that belong to it alone, that define it or are owned by it. So all things lack intrinsic existence, intrinsic reality, intrinsic identity, intrinsic objectivity. That word is hard to say after the fifth time. Intrinsic referentiality. I'm building a little case here. So I'm quoting some people um, because just hearing the word empty isn't enough for me. So I don't know if it's enough for you, but my head keeps like going back to it. And um, Trangu Rinpoche in Harmony of Use says that ordinary individuals, of which I count myself, generally understand existence and emptiness as mutually exclusive. Either there's something or there's nothing. The two are seemingly contradictory. However, emptiness really means that things are not self-sufficient or that they're empty of true existence. So there are real things like you and me, and this table, the temple, but these things lack true existence, separate from us, from their own side, and that this is the union of appearance and emptiness. We can't separate how things appear and how they are. It requires us to hold two ideas at the same time. That's pretty damn hard for me. It's really hard. My default is dualistic thinking, the separation of subject and object, and of, you know, of making things one thing or another. But the realized ones remind us uh, that there's a problem with this way of thinking. When we see things as real and permanent, we suffer. We want pleasurable experiences to stay forever. We get into a relationship. I would not be speaking from experience here. Mm -hmm. We get into relationships and want it to last forever, and we panic and we suffer if the loved one pulls away. Or we see someone who's had a bad who we've had a bad interaction with, who really pissed us off, 
and hurt us in some way. And we just always and forever think of them exactly like that, this bad person, every single time we see them. We don't allow for things to change. Or more specifically, we attribute solid and persistent characteristics to what is in truth something that's fleeting and relative. And then I got to thinking about this and I'm like, oh yeah, I, I might do that. Have you ever wondered how it is that you have an experience of someone that's so different from someone else's experience of the same person? It's weird. It's like, were we in the same room? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. 10 different people can have 10 different experiences of the same person. And that's, this is interdependent relative appearances. Nothing solid, nothing permanent. It's an example. So like I said, my brain has to sort of chip away at this idea. I have to keep hammering at it because I immediately go back to solid states and believing what I see. So bear with me. I'm going to make another cut in the gemstone here. Trangu Rinpoche says that realizing emptiness means that the external things that are objects of mind and the internal mind that is the conscious subject occur through appearances of relative interdependence. It's a mouthful. Relative interdependence means that all things depend on other things or how they're perceived. The idea that I'm here and not there is contingent. Once I walk over there, I'm there and not here, right? And uh, sounds like something out of Lewis Carroll. So it's, it's a shift in perspective. Um, our mind creates these false references. They don't really exist in themselves. So the idea of hereness or thereness, or somebody's tall and someone else is short, those things need other objects to be compared against. They aren't universals. And when things are entirely contingent or relative, they can't be established as anything permanent because they change constantly. So their essence is naturally empty. Can't kind of get that. Dude. So the takeaway, things change constantly. Happiness turns to suffering, like a child's birthday party after cake and excitement, all the guests go home crying. Suffering changes to happiness. We're born, we die, everything's transitory and impermanent. What's funny, but not funny, ha ha, as my mother would say, is that we can know this, but still cling to the hope that it'll turn out different. So we have to continue to learn this over and over again. We still don't want things to change, not the good stuff. We're very stubborn about this. I am. But wisdom realizing emptiness is the ticket out of suffering. It's sort of like I have to think about this. Like, why would I want to give up thinking that love's going to work out? God, I'm not speaking from experience. But if we come to recognize the empty essence of all phenomena, the Buddhist masters say that we won't be harmed by suffering in our th and our thoughts. So the path to freedom. Lama Zopa said, without the wisdom directly realizing the ultimate nature or emptiness of the I, aggregates and all the rest of the phenomena, there's no way to eliminate the root of all our problems. There's no way to eliminate the sufferings of birth, old age, sickness, and death, or the worry and fear of meeting undesirable objects and separating from desirable ones. Ignorance is one of the three root poisons that gives rise to aversion and ignorance. And that ignorance is not understanding the nature of true reality, which is emptiness. So until we really get it, we'll continue to suffer. It's kind of like history is, you know, you're doomed to repeat it until you get it. Um, another quote from Lama Zopa, the root of all these difficulties we go through in our life cannot be eliminated without wisdom. No matter what other realizations we have, whether of Tantra or even Bodhicitta, until we're able to actualize the wisdom realizing the ultimate nature of I and so forth, the root of the whole problem can't be eliminated. Only by having this wisdom can we eliminate the root of our entire samsaric suffering.
Now, I'd like to talk about how Prajnaparamita is the mother of all the Buddhas. Prajnaparamita is not only the name of a teaching, as we were just kind of walked through, that formed the basis of Mahayana Buddhism. It's also the name of the deity who embodies the teaching and thus reality. And so she's often referred to as the great mother or the mother of the Buddhas. But why? How is she the personification of emptiness? How is the personification of emptiness to be a mother? That seems contradictory. The answer lies in part with her association with emptiness. Since all phenomena have arisen from emptiness and all are interdependent, the scholars say that they've never actually arisen. <laughs> They're considered unborn. They have no real origin. Maybe you got that on the first read. <laughs> that blew my mind. Yeah. Um, Prajnaparamita then is the Dharma expanse, the vast primordial and unconditioned ground out of which all experience arise. And in this way, she is a mother without producing. Hold my place here. Just thinking about this earlier. It's like, okay. If something is solid and permanent, then it really can't give birth to anything, right? Yeah. All phenomena, all phenomena which have arisen from emptiness, the mother, are empty of any designations. They're free of concepts attributed to them or any nature or characteristics. Tuptim Chodron says, what we are coming to here is that all the conventional truths of the things that appear in our world and the ultimate truth, the ultimate mode of existence, are inseparable. So the conventional truth, such as a flower, and the ultimate truth, its emptiness, are said to be one nature, and that one can't exist without the other. Beautiful. So beautiful. They're also different, phenomenally different. They're not the same thing because the flower is just an appearance and the emptiness is the actual mode of being. So same for us, right? We appear and yet we too are part of the permanent nature of emptiness. And in this way, we glimpse our mother, the Dharmakaya. So like the flower analogy, we too um, are part of the permanent nature of emptiness. And this is, we're then, our existence, we're reflecting our mother. We appear, but we're really empty, right? It's changing moment by moment. For the scholar Red Pine, Prajnaparamita, and specifically her mantra, is likened to the womb of the Buddhas. The Heart Sutra contains a summary of the teachings in the form of a mantra that compels us to go beyond conceptual categories. I'm just breaking down a few of the terms here. Gate, gate, it's gone, gone. Paragate, gone over. Parasamgate, gone beyond. And the psalm, and I love this, the psalm in parasamgate means together which is what Lama La always says, we go together, our enlightenment can't happen alone. It's simply not in the nature of reality. Red Pine says that the function of the mantra is to go beyond language and the categories in which language imprisons us and leads us into the womb of Prajnaparamita, which is gone, gone beyond. He says that she's called the mother or the womb of the Buddhas because Buddhas become Buddhas as a result of their ability to penetrate and tra be transformed by this teaching, which is considered equivalent to the Dharma expanse. And then finally, the mantra concludes with Bodhi Soha. Bodhi is awakened mind. And Soha is like an homage or proclamation. So it's homage to the awakened mind that's gone over to the other shore suffering. And he says this last part, the last two lines, is a birth. It's giving birth to our enlightenment. Judith Simmer Brown writes, Prajnaparamita is the symbolic mother of all those who realize this empty nature. 
That is, this insight is the beginning of the practitioner's uncovering of awakened nature. Finding no inherent essence and phenomena awakens non-dual wisdom in the practitioner, and this is the seed of Buddhahood. Trumpa Rinpoche expresses the journey to liberation through the Heart Sutra, saying, at the beginning it speaks in terms of the meditative state, and finally it speaks of mantra or words, and this is because in the beginning we must develop a confidence in our understanding, clearing out all preconceptions, nihilism, eternalism, all beliefs have to be cut through, transcended. And when a person is completely, exp this is not Trangu Rinpoche, this is Tr Trungpa Rinpoche. I, none of this language was the other. Uh, when the person is completely exposed, fully unclothed, fully unmasked, completely naked, completely opened, at that very moment, he sees the power of word. When the basic, absolute, ultimate hypocrisy has been unmasked, then one really begins to see the jewel shining in the, its brightness, the energetic living quality of openness, the living quality of surrender, the living quality of renunciation. And that's my talk, and I will close with a quick little poem by Arya Deva. The meaning of the Prajnaparamita is not to be looked for elsewhere. It exists within yourself, neither real nor endowed with characteristics. The nature of the mind is in the great clear light. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> bye. <laughs> Questions, yeah, please, softball, please. <laughs> oh, thank you. Please give Deb the microphone. <laughs> Make sure you talk like this. Yeah. That's all I had to say. Oh. <laughs> I would really like it. <clears throat> If you publish that in Lion's Roar, oh, I think it's publishable. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> What'd you say? Uh, this, I think it's a blog thing. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm really impressed with your taking on this topic. <laughs> oh, I didn't. I was handed it. Well, you didn't run screaming, so good for you. Thanks. <laughs> uh, but wow, I mean, I think this demonstrates to me the value of, of Sangha doing these teachings because um, um, I'll be honest, like sometimes when Mama talks, it goes over my head. Yeah. And this didn't, I'm not like every moment of it sunk in, but more so, more so for sure. The way you, you brought it um, was really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> this is probably a dumb question. Not dumb, but... Okay, so we start to intellectually understand. Now what? How do we get... How do we stabilize that realization? Oh, uh, sh shamatha. <laughs> yeah. How does it has to be. do that? Well, uh, yeah, thank you, Patty. Patty, uh, space. Um, <laughs> yeah, we make a bigger container. Uh, we, we, yeah. Patty, would you like to go ahead? And... No, please, please. You know, you talk about shamatha a lot on Thursday night, and it's really helpful. It really is helpful. I mean, I could answer, but I just like each day. Got it. Please. Um, I bought you coffee. Well, I um I don't want to say so much because Jen is fully qualified um, to, to as much as I am at least. I mean, but I was just mentioning because on Thursdays we do meditation and um uh, these uh, ideas that we read about and sort of start to well, like there's a little opening from from our studies, and then by um, practicing uh, meditation, um, we uh, you know there's some space created and there's something about that that he talks about with us about having a larger container that this what we consider ourselves the solid self maybe you want to speak more to that yeah too. Uh, well 
I absolutely will piggyback on that. Is I I think when we practice shamatha and we practice this sort of and the pashna together, right? So it's the calming meditation, the analytical meditation. We are stabilizing our 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 thoughts and 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 we are creating a space to be more open. We're watching our minds, looking at the nature of reality, following our thoughts, asking where where do they come from? What is the mind? What is the nature of this? And we begin to question. We um Rinpoche talks a lot about slowing things down, right? Like I think so much of the time. It's like a film, right? It's moving. Life is moving really fast, and the cells of the frame make it seem like it's a solid moving. This is old school. Okay, but makes it look like a solid stream. But if we can slow it down enough, we see the gaps in things, and we can begin to question and and find answers, and be open to hearing the answers instead of being reactive, and just um, coming from our fixed point of view. Thank you for your talk, Jen. There is so much going on there. I, I don't even feel qualified to ask questions or to comment. Um, it was very rich, a lot to chew on. Um, I got a sense, I'm still learning, right? I'm, I'm a baby in, in this uh, journey. Um, but emptiness sounds like uh, when we think we know something and we've kind of pigeonholed it, a person, a flower, you know, we think we know it based upon the the name we gave it, the characteristics we ascribe to it. I think, at least from hearing you, what we're saying is that we don't really know it, right? We don't really know it. That the, the flower isn't a flower like you know it. It's an expression of nature. Um, and, and it's the same with people when we say, I'm an addict. I'm uh, a good person. Well, mm, maybe not. Uh, maybe these things that you think you know about yourself are empty because mm -hmm. we're constantly changing. We aren't one thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm understanding that correctly, but that's mm -hmm. what I got out of it. I think I think you're on. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. And I think that um, we <laughs> think things are solid. We, we, you know, ascribe these characteristics, but they don't. We're assigning. This is assigning that. It doesn't come with those things and all of the meaning that we unpack with all of that stuff. It's, it's there, but we kind of create this whole narrative around it, right? Um, and if we can get out of that, it's, very, it, it's freeing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you, Jen. Appreciate it. Um, I think I'm piggybacking a little bit off of Andrew's question. Um, it sounded to me like you caught a glimpse of Prajnaparamita with a rug pull, so to speak, like when everything kind yes. of came crumbling down, yeah. all the conceptual building right came crumbling down and then there was sort of this silent ha uh, right and a little glimpse and i was curious if you have any like i hear that shamatha vipassana meditation is ultimately how we develop or come to see our mother so to speak i was just wondering do you think that there's like um little tips or tricks for catching glimpses that are not necessarily just that you know like is there, are there other, like, can we pull the rug out ourselves or are there other moments where we can sort of be aware, where we can sort of see Prajna Paramita, even just catch a little, little glimpse? Like maybe I've heard somebody say like the, the space between thoughts, like paying attention to that. Is there anything like that that might be helpful? Uh, thanks. Um, so yeah, there was the second sort of meta thing that happened, like the, it, the same thing happened with Heart Sutra, like sort of with when I was at a darshan and then like there were 
50 people there and I was so irritated. And I'm like, what is happening? Why are people at my darshan? And and then um and then the whole thing about getting enlightened together, you know, it was like I had this aha. And then the same thing happened here. So so I guess the first thing I would say is if if you really want a glimpse, you know, go to Darshan. <laughs> that'll that'll be the fast track. Um and um I'm not sure that I I hadn't thought about tips or tricks, but um, I know a lot of us here practice, uh, you know, Shamada Vipassana. So would anybody like to share their, how they get spacious and their experience? Yeah. So, so the, fir the first thing that I, when I put my hand up at first, um, which isn't entirely responding to your question, but uh, when I was in art school, I was told that Pablo Picasso said, if you, if you say it accurately, if you want to be, if you want to find your muse, let her find you at the easel. So basically, practice, practice, and then sometimes some weird thing will come up and hit you in the head, and it'll knock you out of your preconceived conditions that are, um, you know, holding you back during your practice. That's, I think, I always thought that, I, I don't really know anything about this, but I always hear the stories of the Japanese culture, it's like hitting somebody on the head or whatever while they're meditating. And then somebody told me it meant something specific. But for me, I thought, wow, sometimes I've been in meditation and a dog will bark really loud in the room or something, you know, like that'll happen or a car will backfire or something. And all of a sudden I go pop, you know, and it's like I get out of my stag stagnant state. <laughs> so I don't know, that sort of is around the area that I experiment with a little bit. I love that. I love that so much. And, and our, our teacher often will go, what if I just shout it hey, yeah. really loud? I, I <laughs> or, which is better than getting a slap across yeah. the face with the yeah. sandal. Yeah. How to take that? Sort of thing. But you know, I don't know. It could work. Yeah. I kind of, I don't know. Getting hit by a sandal or something might not be too bad. Sometimes it's hard to cut through the clutter. Um, hi, my name is Bob. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it was a beautiful teaching. Uh, so you ask, what are different ways that we can develop shamatha and vipassana? And uh, one of my favorite meditations is on the elements. And so when we look at like reality through a certain kind of paradigm, and then we can start to take away those constructs that support the paradigm one by one, then maya drops the illusion dissolves as the supports of the illusion dissolve mm -hmm. and so a meditation that i really enjoy is uh consuming concentrations where you put your mind on a single element like earth or wind or fire or empty space and then as you just focus on the only mental image that's arising in the mind and covering the parts of your experience is that one element you develop single-pointed focus with practice ease and bliss and then once you get to that shamatha of developing that deep abiding concentration you dissolve away that support one by one and as you dissolve it away from the most gross to the most subtle so you go uh, earth water fire wind empty space and then you drop into understanding where the images are even coming from in the first place which is dependent on origin origination so you have then vipassana and then when you walk around in the world you say how am i supporting my illusion in this idea of the element like a traffic signal or the element of like a like the structure of i or the movement as i go from here to there i'm going to become happy because happiness is over there so that's the element of wind. And so you can just focus on catching how avidya, like uh, misseeing or ignorance, is 
totally connected to these uh, fictitious constructs, and then you dissolve them away. Um, and then another one that's really nice is called the Lion's Dance. Um, if anybody, that was uh, Master Asanga. Um, really beautiful meditation where you go from the uh, most gross uh, consciousness, and then you essentially imagine chopping away at a piece of wood as you drop away hot, like more and more gross levels of consciousness. So like the dog barking, you say, okay, my mind's there. I pin it there and I'm leaving it there. Let me go deeper. And then you go to the next. And so Vitaka Vichara and Asmita. So you go through these levels and you just leave your consciousness there until you get to a super subtle state. Because then it's the movie slowed down enough where you don't have to catch the frames per second. You're stuck on a single frame. And then you catch the luminous image that's creating the image because the frames aren't rolling anymore. It's nice. just a single frame. Nice. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. There's um, also um, Tralog Rinpoche's Mind at Ease, if you want to look at different techniques out as well. It's really quite lovely. And it has some similar ones. I am very nervous. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so um, first of all, I'm I'm I have borderline personality disorder, which is ruining a lot of my relationships. And so I'm always I've been looking into a lot of ideas about liminality, the the in between um, one thing to the other. So when I'm swinging from here to here, I'm focusing on that liminality where. Where did I get from here to here in that brief moment? <laughs> um, and there's a lot of things in my head with this talk, and it was a great talk. Um, I got a lot out of it. Um, but one of the things that was popping into my head was um, Carl Jung's idea of collective unconscious. And um, I believe that we're all here because collectively, from past, um, we've had this pull or push, however you want to see it, um, to be here. Um, and reading uh, Joseph Campbell's book, uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces, it brings to mind, um, it's, it's a circuitous kind of hero's journey where um, we're comfortable here um, but once we cross this threshold into the unknown of not knowing um, our egos above here in this like comfort space, we're fine with, with who we are. But when we go past that, um, we grab hold of part of what a Carl Jung called the shadow. And that's the part of ourselves we don't like people to see. Um, and through this journey, we overcome that fear or that isolation or um, whatever that piece of the shadow because think of you think of it as um like an iceberg the ego kind of floats on top and the iceberg that's who we really are that we don't really show people um but through this journey this hero's journey you grab a piece of that shadow and you come out with a better understanding of who you are and what you can give people um so going back to the liminality um Part of that is you've started in your ordinary comfy world where everybody accepts you because that's all you're showing. Um, and we're taking a tiny piece of our ego with us to go through this journey of entering this cave we fear to enter and we enter it anyway um, in order to come out um, a better human. for sharing. Huh? I need to hear it and read it again. You know, there was so much that you presented and integrated. I really would like to read it again and, and absorb it. Well, um, and I'm happy to share some of the books 
that you know the names of the books, but thank you. Okay. All right. I can get you a copy. Thank you. Do we have any questions from Zoomers? <laughs> yeah, those are previous chats. All right, any questions left in house? One more. Thank you for your talk. I can you hear me? I yes. I appreciate the um the focus and the uh and the interest that you put into that a lot. Um I see it as the more you practice, the more your ego, from which all this duality springs from the intellect, the ego becomes seems becomes more transparent. And the more transparent it becomes, the more you kind of step back and or you're able to see what's behind that, what's supporting it, where it came from. Uh, which is leading in the direction of uh, the ultimate um, wisdom or whatever, whatever we, all the wisdom traditions talk about the ultimate. And that's what I think we're talking about here is, is getting uh, closer to having a grasp of that. So that's what I think what happens. Your ego, your ego doesn't disappear, but it, it becomes transparent. The framework is still there. And uh, even when you're enlightened, you still can function as a human being. You still have a kind of identity, but you're more identified with the the big identity, which is the ultimate, which is behind everything. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know about the ultimate, but but I think that it certainly it's like a, feels like. Um, opening up a clamshell you know like there's just room to not to breathe and to be more creative and quiet and that open to the surprise that we're, we're just our ordinary you know re, kind of day-to-day -day experience the 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 is so limiting we're so limited in in our reactions and our and who we think we are we're so much more because we're just part of each other and because and we create these things together so it's it, it's like going from a single dot to a Seurat painting you know it's just yeah yeah thank you very much <laughs> Let's close. Is this still on? I just um I, I know everyone's expressed so much appreciation, but you know, um I, I learned so much today and I would like to uh read it your talk again because uh, maybe because we're friends, but when I when I hear you talk it, I feel like my own understanding is is expanding. So thank you so much, Jim. So we'll do closing prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chanwezi of Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Bosong. Magical display of the deep awareness of all victorious things.
Press or give a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortune of my peers. I will give a great treasure of objects. Mind to assure you, Master Dwell's wisdom. Flash upon you, destroy every entire host of mines, some copper, crown jewels, stone and sages, close some dragon, and make requests that you believe. I know you can probably hear my voice, but I was just so completely moved by Jen's talk. And also that we have a teacher that trusts us to give such talks. So thank you so much. And um, I have a simple announcement, but I need to say uh, that on uh, April 7th, we're going to have another refuge ceremony and entering the path ceremony because of a few of our friends. It's one of them, a couple of them here today. And they're so special people. So I hope you'll join us April 7th. And then um, we have uh, expressions um, in two weeks. Expressions is the art uh, program that we have here at 7 o'clock. It's on February 23rd. And dance and music. And because uh, our teacher often says, um, just like a friend here was sharing, that art saves lives in more ways than we can even begin to say. It can express the un inexpressible through poetry and through paint and through dance. We're trying to say it with words, but sometimes we we, well, we just can't. And then, um, let me think if there's anything else. Oh, we have the men's group today, which is very important. Dharma dudes right after this. <laughs> so funny. Dharma dudes, but it, it's very memorable, that's for sure. And they're good friends. Have I anything else, Jen? Something, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, well, oh, hold on. I, I'm going to have you talk. So uh, Andrew is leading that group, so I'm going to let him speak. Uh, anyone is welcome to, I mean, any dude is welcome uh, to come today. It doesn't, you don't have to have been before. And if you don't find it to your liking, you can leave. <laughs> there will be snacks. We can talk some more about uh, what all that's been stirred up first by this talk and, and whatever else we're interested in, so. Oh, I just wanted to say uh, that today is uh, Losar is a 15 day celebration and our tradition, we're celebrating it. And you see there's more candles than usual. Uh, flowers, it's like Losar every every week because of our good friend Susan. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, we are kind of today uh, and all days thinking of the past in a way like our obstacles and problems as something that we can um, used going forward whether it's the good things or the bad things to use us to open our hearts even further so happy losar everyone here and everyone online <laughs> and thank you jen for helping all of us understand a little bit more oh and then I, uh this is matthew i did want to mention that next oh and we have donations online and in person to help us keep going and we need all of your help to help us do that thank you again Omo araya pazaya na aindi Om araya pazaya na aindi Omo araya pazaya na aindi